All right, welcome everyone to the Zojo webinar. I am Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And this is one of those special weeks where you don't actually get to listen to me do the webinar because I have a special guest, Tim Dietrich, who's done a couple, I think a couple webinars for us in the past. And Tim is a FileMaker expert and on his way to becoming a Zojo expert as well. And is going to talk to you today about interfacing with FileMaker databases using uh, something he calls Luna for web services. Tim, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks for setting this up. As always, I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm Tim Dietrich. I am a custom software developer and an author. Um, I'm currently focusing on developing web APIs, and I'll talk in a moment about how I kind of fell into doing that. Um, I also still develop uh, mobile apps. Most of them are sort of business-oriented apps that hit databases, and uh, that's part of what we'll see here today, I suppose, um, you know, how I'm doing that. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I used to do a lot of work in the FileMaker space, but nowadays most of my work is done in Zojo. Uh, I started using Zojo to develop uh, mobile apps, uh, so I think my sort of path to Zojo is a little bit different from a lot of other Zojo developers who had been using it for years. And then when the iOS support came out, there was just a, yet another uh, benefit of knowing the platform. But for me, I came into it uh, to use um, Zojo's iOS support. And since then, I've developed web apps, um, some console apps, uh, including some spiders and bots and all kinds of crazy things like that. So uh, the benefit of having um, a platform like that where you can learn one language and develop a variety of different types of apps that run on a variety of different types of platforms has uh, really paid off for me. And I've been using Zojo, I think it's been, I want to say about two years now, it'll be definitely be two years in the fall um, when I uh, went looking for a new development environment. And Zojo was one of the ones I looked for and, uh, or looked at rather, and uh, it was the one that really kind of resonated with me, the one I felt the most comfortable with. And so sort of after spending some time using it, using live code, Swift, um, I really decided that Zojo was right for me. And that's really, again, what the majority of my work these days is done in. So my interest in APIs sort of stemmed from um, kind of moving into the mobile app development space. And uh, I had, I guess, maybe uh, kind of behind the ball a little bit, but I did not realize how important APIs were to mobile apps. Uh, mobile apps are different from desktop and web apps in that you, know, you don't typically connect directly from a mobile app to a database. Uh, I know you can do that with things like Go where you can connect directly to a hosted FileMaker database, um, but not most of the time you don't do that. You connect a mobile app to a database using an API so when I started doing mobile app development, you know, the importance of APIs became very clear to me. And um, since then, I have really kind of taken on what I like to call an API first approach or strategy to developing the systems that I create. So, um, you know, the importance of APIs has grown even more for me. Uh, it's really one of the first things I consider doing when I'm taking on a new project. And you know, I'm kind of happy to say that right now there's a lot of demand for API development. So if you're looking for something new to get into, um, you know, it's definitely a, a growth area, as is uh, microservices, which is kind of related to APIs. Um, I'm not going to talk about those today, but those are definitely areas where there's a lot of demand. And there's also demand, I think, uh, for FileMaker integration in general. When I was doing a lot of FileMaker work, uh, it was mostly projects that involved integration with other systems that really were the juicy projects. So if you're a FileMaker developer out there, um, you know, learning how to integrate FileMaker with other systems is certainly something that can be uh, beneficial uh, to you. So and I think uh, what you see today might help you to do that kind of work. Luna. Um, when I realized that I needed to be able to connect mobile apps to databases using APIs, I kind of realized that I also needed a way to develop APIs. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time looking at best practices and the ways that people um, 
uh, you know, use and create APIs using other technologies. And out of that came Luna, which is a framework for creating RESTful web APIs. Uh, again, it was developed with Sojo, which is kind of why we're here today, and why Sojo is letting me give the webinar, I suppose. <laughs> And uh, Luna was developed or is being provided as an open source solution so under an open source license. I originally developed Luna to support databases that I have developed that running on, are running on Amazon Aurora, as well as um, just standard MySQL databases. Um, Aurora is Amazon's sort of MySQL flavor, if you will. And um, after I made it open source, uh, the community uh, kind of picked it up and also added Postgres support for it as well. So uh, that was really pretty neat to see. It wasn't long after I made uh, Luna available that other members of the community uh, started using it and extending it. So you know that's really neat to see. So that's Luna. Now, FM Luna is a special version of um, Luna that's designed for the FileMaker platform. It, uh, it integrates with hosted FileMaker databases using XML custom web publishing. And like Luna itself, it is also open source. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate today. So before I kind of dive into that, uh, I guess one question to answer is, why would you want to create an API for a FileMaker database? And uh, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier, and that is to be able to integrate your FileMaker databases with other systems, whether it's mobile apps, web apps. You know, I've got people that have reached out to me that want to integrate with WordPress and e-commerce systems like Shopify. And to be honest with you, um, when you've got an API out in front of a FileMaker database like that, just about any modern system is going to be able to connect to your FileMaker database, whether it's pulling data from the database or pushing it in, um, having that API really uh, you know, opens up a world of possibilities for you. So one of the neat things about having an API is that if you um, work with other developers um, who maybe have no idea what FileMaker is and don't really care to know what it is, uh, you know, if you provide them access to the API, they can do whatever they need to do. And again, not only not know anything about FileMaker in order to do their work, but they don't even need to know that FileMaker is what's behind the scenes. To them, it's just another API. So uh, a few more um, benefits to partners, vendors, customers, et cetera, as well the business uh, cases or use cases for uh, having an API uh, you know, become available to you when you create an API for your FileMaker database. And you can also use these APIs to uh, create, if you're a FileMaker developer and you're thinking about creating a software as a service solution, you can create uh, scalable solutions with FileMaker on the back end, um, you know, with the API out in front of it. So uh, as far as scalability goes, it sort of, again, opens up a world of possibilities for you. And I think one of the other really uh, neat benefits of this is that with an API in front of your database, you can provide access to the database without using concurrent connections. So um, you can have a, a scalable web or a scalable mobile application that's going through the API to get to the database and not consume any concurrent connections uh, in doing so. So let me see a question up there. Let me take a question real quick before I continue. I've lost my cursor. There it is. So the question asked or was asked, uh, can I build FileMaker Go apps without using a concurrent connection? And yes, you most certainly can. Um, what you can do is use the insert from URL uh, script step and then uh, send a request to your FM Luna API. And you, know, you can either get data from the FileMaker database, you can update records, delete, whatever. Um, so yeah, it certainly does make that a possibility. And again, it does so without the need for the concurrent connection. So if your uh, FileMaker server you know, is limited in terms of the number of connections it supports, uh, you you know, with an API, you really don't need to worry too much about maxing out on the concurrent connections. So definitely one of the big benefits of it. So close that window. Having trouble making all the little screens that pop up and come down, go away. <laughs> there it goes. 
All right. So again, those are some of the reasons why you might want to create an API for your FileMaker databases. It's kind of in my experience that um, I think people realize they need an API uh, when the moment strikes. In other words, there's an opportunity that comes up. Maybe you've landed some uh, juicy new client, and part of what they want is you know, the ability to uh, get data or push data into other systems from FileMaker. And so at that point, it kind of becomes a mad rush to get an API set up for your FileMaker database. Cool thing about FM Luna is that all the hard work is kind of done. So you just kind of wire it up, and there's your API. So some of the benefits of FM Luna, uh, it is based on Luna, which again is that framework that I had originally created sort of uh, for SQL oriented databases. Um, it was designed to implement sort of best practices that I found in the industry and it creates really professional APIs that developers seem to enjoy using. So um, the fact that it's built on that foundation, I think, um, you know, makes FM Luna like right away uh, you know a, a really nice uh, solution for you and as I mentioned earlier it uses this XML custom web publishing uh, so it does not need to consider current connections you can provide access to your data affordably and you have the ability to scale in ways that you, know, you never did before so. so then the next question becomes okay well if I'm going to create an API for my FileMaker database why would I want to do it using a Zojo based API and, um, and the big reason for me is that Luna is a Zojo web application. So that means that it can actually be compiled and it can be compiled as a standalone app, as a CGI, whatever, however you want to do it. The beauty of that is that you can then host um, low end Macs, Windows machines, uh, or low end Linux servers, and it just works. It's also extremely secure, extremely fast. I mean, it, it does not need Apache or anything out in front of it. So it is completely self-contained. Um, and some of the speed that I've seen uh, from it has been really pretty amazing. Uh, I have some um, both Luna and FM Luna instances running on EC2 servers, and it's just it's been pretty wild to see the performance that we've had with it. So. Um, but you know, another really nice benefit of the fact that it's built with Zojo is that you have all of the capabilities of the language of the Zojo language available to you. So if you do have some kind of a, a unique or a challenging uh, API that you need to create, there, there's a pretty good chance that, or a very good chance rather, that you're gonna be able to create that thing with Zojo. So um, you know, again, you've got this uh, amazingly powerful language at your disposal when you're creating your APIs. So it really just depends on how simple or complex your API is as to whether you need all that uh, power, but it's nice to know that it's there. So let me see, I think there's been a couple more questions. Does Luna have to be installed on the FileMaker server? Um, no, it does not. That's actually one of the really neat things about it. I have um, Luna instances that are running on an, an EC2 server, a Linux EC2 server, that are connecting the FileMaker databases um, that are hosted on FileMaker server, on other EC2 servers, um, on shared hosting environments that are hosted in-house. So the Luna instance or FM Luna instance can be hosted somewhere completely different from the FileMaker server. Of course, you'll get some latency uh, as a result of that, but from what I've seen, it's so fast that you, know, you, really, you really can't tell anyway. Um, so, so that's another really good question. All right, so I'm going to jump into the demo in a moment. I'm going to show you how you can actually create uh, just a real basic API with Luna. I'm going to demonstrate some of the API calls, and um, I'll take some Q&A, I guess, as we go. Um, so I'll try to keep an eye on the Q&A window. So let's jump into the demo. So let me start by showing you the FileMaker database that I'm going to use for the demo today. It's really, really basic. Uh, just a simple FileMaker database of 100 contacts, um, you know, with your kind of typical contact type information, first name, last name, city, state. Let me go to the form view so you can see all the other fields. Not much there. Uh, but I've got a form view and a list view, and uh, that's really all that there is to it. 
As far as configuring your FileMaker database so that Luna can access it, uh, you really just need an account in the database that has uh, the XML web publishing enabled. It's really the only thing that you need to do. Uh, you can certainly take it further than that if you want to uh, limit what that account uh, can see. Like, for example, if you want to limit the records that it can see, the fields that it can see, uh, and so on, it, the FM Luna honors uh, the standard FileMaker native security model. So you just configure the account but with the privileges that you want the API to have, and uh, it'll kind of take it from there. So again, a real basic database, just list view, form view. I can stick with list view for a moment. Again, see that there's 100 records in there. Now I'm going to jump over to Zojo. So this is the Zojo IDE, for those of you who have never seen it before. And I've got an instance of the uh, FM Luna project open. And again, this too, there's not a whole lot to it. There's uh, an FM Luna class, which you really don't need to poke around in, but you're certainly welcome to do so. This is where all the magic and the heavy lifting happens. So if you're curious and want to kind of get under the hood, you can look in there. But most of the work that you're going to want to do is in the app itself. So to wire up your instance of uh, FM Luna, you go into the properties. And there's four properties that you're going to want to look at. Um, there's the host itself, where you would put in the address of the, uh, the server that you're connecting to, <clears throat> the database name, the protocol, whether you want to connect over HTTP or HTTPS. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice, figures. And whether you want uh, connections to, uh, that are coming into FM Luna to be required to come over uh, a secure connection as well, you can indicate that. Uh, so I've got that set to false right now because I'm going to be running in debug mode. So you just set up those four properties, sort of uh, wire up uh, FM Luna to your database, and that's all there is to it. And notice that I didn't put any um, account information in FM Luna itself. I'm actually going to specify that when I make my API calls. Now, that's one approach. Um, you can actually let uh, uh, FM Luna sort of just use the account name and username that is specified in the API call and just pass those on to FileMaker. But you could also hardwire that account information in here if you wanted to, and then have, you know, roll your own uh, authentication if you wanted. Um, I don't really recommend that. Uh, I kind of prefer to use FileMaker standard security, but it's certainly a possibility. So, so there's the properties. All right. So before I kind of dig further into the Zojo app itself, I'm going to show you some uh, API calls. And to do that, I'm going to use a program called Paul. Let me show you that real quick. Um, if you're curious about it, you can just go to paul.cloud. You guys probably see it better than I do that uh, Zoom window is kind of blocking my view. So it's paul.cloud is the uh, URL. So uh, this is a Mac-based API tool. And um, I think I'm in this just as much as I'm in the Zojo IDE these days. It has become sort of indispensable for me. Uh, it's great for not only consuming other APIs, but for cr uh, creating your own and testing your own APIs. So uh, if you're on a Mac and you're going to do some API work, um, you might want to take a look at this. It's uh, highly, highly recommended. So I'm going to jump over to my copy of Paul. And I've got uh, three categories of, uh, of API calls that I'm going to make today and demonstrate. This first group is all about getting data from the database through the API. So the first one is designed just to get a list of those contacts. And again, for this demo, it's just a real basic database. You're going to be making real basic calls. But the ideas give you an idea of uh, what it takes, what the API calls look like. The first one is about as basic as it gets. I'm basically saying I want you to get records uh, from the contacts table. I'm going to pass the account name and password. And I've just got those set to FM Luna just for the demo. And if I Go ahead and make that API call. 
Oh, I forgot to run the app itself. I'm going to jump back over to Sojo and I'm going to run the app in the debug mode. There's the Luna splash screen that comes up when you first start up the app. Jump back over to Paul and let me make that call again. And this time you see I actually got some records back. Um, it's actually returning 90 records. And if you remember, the database itself had 100 records in it. So um, the reason that I'm only getting 90 back, and I'll show you in just a moment, is uh, I've actually set up the API so that out of that 100 records, I'm only going to uh, uh, return or, or expose uh, the quote unquote active records that are in the database. So uh, if I jump over here into FileMaker, do a find for just the active records. You can see that 90 out of 100 of those records have a status that's been set to active. And so if I jump back over now into Sojo itself, I'm going to go back into the app and I'm going to go into the methods for the app. There's a contacts get method. And this is the code that supports getting uh, the data back. And I actually have a filter in here. There's, uh, it's pretty well, well commented. And if you download um, the FM Luna from my site, this is the version that you'll see. Um, but you can see I've um, added a filter. And I'm basically telling uh, FileMaker Server that when I uh, make a request for a list of contacts, that those uh, contacts should have a status of, of active. So that's why we're getting 90 out of 100 records. So let me jump back over here, and I want to expand one of these records so you can see that for each record, I'm getting back a record ID, a modification ID, and then the first name, last name, city, state, and status. And you might notice that that's not all the fields that I have in that table over in FileMaker. The reason that I'm not getting all, all the uh, fields back is that in my Zojo code, I've actually told it that I want, it, I want you to use uh, the contacts list layout whenever you're getting a list of contacts for the API. And so only the fields that are on that layout are going to be returned through FM Luna. So if I jump back over here, you can see that first name, last name, city, state, and status are the only fields on that layout. And that's why we're seeing just those come back through the API call. So that's, again, probably the most basic type of API call that you can make uh, through FM Luna. Um, you know, again, just a straight up list of records. But we also have the ability, if you notice, that these records aren't um, in alphabetical order. Let me sort of expand a few more. You know, I'm just getting them back sort of randomly. They're in the, the order that they are physically in the FileMaker database. But if, if I wanted to get um, the records back and I wanted them sorted in a certain way, I can go back over into Zojo and go into this, um, go into the method for context get. And I think I've got it commented out right here. I'm going to enable this. I'm going to stop FM Luna and then rerun it. And this time when I run the API or make the API call, I should see them come back in alphabetical order. And you can tell they've changed. Um, and sure enough, the last name is Albana and Ortega and so on. So just um, showing that to you because um, you can use this, uh, I call them URL extras, but you can use that when you're developing your endpoints in FM Luna so that when you're making a request for data, you can have the FileMaker server do some additional processing before it sends the data back. In this case, I'm sorting um, the records. You could also have it sort and then maybe run a script on the server side as well. So some really interesting possibilities uh, come up when you think about what that you know, what, what that feature does. So let me jump back over to Paul. So again, that first um, API call just got a list of records back. The next one that I want to show you is uh, kind of demonstrates the concept of paging through the data. So again, in the database that I have right here, I only have 90 records in it, but suppose I had 900 records in it. And you know, chances are you, your client application, whatever it is that's making the API call, probably doesn't want to get all, you know, 900 or 1,000 of those records back at one time. It might want to get them in chunks. 
And so FM Luna supports uh, both offset and maximum parameters. Just put them into the URL itself. So it's the same uh, get uh, request that you saw earlier. This time I'm telling it that I want it to start uh, with an offset of two, and then I only want to get two records back at a time. So this is kind of an extreme uh, example of not getting a lot back, but let me run it and you'll see what I mean. So you can see right away that I did just get two records back. And it actually did start uh, with the second, I guess actually would be the third record, depending on how you're counting. Um, but it did skip uh, two records and then give me two back. I could then adjust the maximum and get 20 back if I want. So depending on your application and the type of data you're working with, you can certainly adjust the offset and the max accordingly. And again, sort of get your data back in um, bite-sized chunks, if you will. So that's the paging. Another feature that FM Luna supports is filtering. And so that's completely up to you as to how you want to implement it on the server side. Uh, but you can actually allow um, your API clients to filter the records further than what they originally were. So for example, in this, ex uh, this case, I'm going to API call and I'm telling the API that I only want to get contacts back where the contacts state value is set to California. And when I make that call, I get seven records back. If I sort of expand some of these, you'll see that sure enough, they are all from California. So that's another nice feature. Let me show you the code real quick um, where that's happening. So right here in my Zojo code, again, for that get uh, method, I have uh, some code in here that says if the um, API request included uh, a state parameter, to go ahead and apply that as well, include that when you make the call to FileMaker server. And so when the XML call is made, that uh, filter is also sent over. And so FileMaker then just returns back just the records that meet that criteria. Of course, you could add as many of these types of filter uh, filters as you want. So you could allow you know, filtering by city and state, by zip code, you could support ranges, however you want to do it. It's entirely up to you. So before I continue, let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. So if you have a portal on the FileMaker layout, is that data returned as well? Um, I'm not doing much right now with the portals. Um, my approach to dealing with portals and getting the related records is to actually make a second API call to get that data back. I think that's probably the easiest way to get the data at this point. However, you can get related data from other records. So for example, if in my contacts uh, database here, if the contacts table was related to say a company's table um, and there was a relationship established there, um, I could just drag over fields from the related table like the company name and they will be returned through uh, FM Luna. So uh, that's kind of a, a neat uh, way to get additional data. You could certainly wire up your instance of FM Luna to support containers. And if you did that, you could actually then make a single call, like for example, to a, a database that has orders. Maybe you're asking for an order and its line items, and you could get that entire thing back at one time. It would just mean that you'd need to write a little bit more um, you know, advanced or complicated uh, endpoint for that type of request. Um, I'm going to show in just a moment how containers are returned, but yes, we do support uh, containers through FM Luna. And Gaston is asking, would it be possible to find such filter our data using SQL type requests? Um, I suppose it would be possible. You'd probably need to do some stuff on the FileMaker side as well to support that. You could probably do execute SQL, for example, and get the data back through that. Um, but yeah, it would be possible to do it. Uh, it would just it would be a little bit tricky, but you know if that's something you're interested in doing at some point, just drop me a line and I'll kind of tell you how I would approach it. But yeah, you could certainly do that. Okay, let me jump back over. All right, so the last thing I showed you was filtering based on uh, field values. Um, the other thing that you can do, and this is kind of interesting. Um, in my um, request to get a list of records, I'm getting back 
of last name, city, state, and status. But what if the API client really didn't need all that? What if they really just needed a few of those fields? Well, you can um, provide support, actually, it's right out of the box with Ethan Luna, for what I'm calling the fields parameter. Um, you just pass it as a URL uh, variable. And then you uh, make a comma delimited list of the, of the fields that you want to get back. So in this case, I'm saying I want to just get back first name, last name, and state. If I send that request, you can see that now the data that's coming back is just those three fields. And if I wanted to kind of limit that a little bit further, I can do so. So if you have a layout that has a ton of fields on it, and you do want to make those all available to your API clients, great. Um, but with the fields parameter, the client can then say, well, you know, I really just need a few of those. So don't give me all that data. I don't want you know, a huge payload coming down the, down the pipe. Just give me just the data that I want. So I think that's a really nice feature. It's the ability to sort of filter the fields that come back. On a similar note, it also supports aliases. So if in this example, if the client wants to get first name and last name back, but they want to refer to those values using different names, you can actually use um, aliasing. It's somewhat like what you would expect in a select statement in SQL, where I'm saying, okay, give me just these fields back, but I want you to use for the first underscore name, I want you to use sort of a JavaScript uh, type uh, you know, name uh, convention. So if I go ahead and run this, see the same data is coming back, but the column names are now different. So there's first name, last name, and so on. So you can not only uh, filter the fields that are coming back, but you can actually tell FM Luna, bring them back to me and call them something different. And that's completely up to the client, how they you know, want those things to be named. So, so far I've made a bunch of calls where I'm getting back a collection of records, a list of records. But what if I want to get back a specific record? Let me... Um, Get back up here for just a second. Let's look at the at one of these records that I got back in my original call. And if I look at it, this first record has a, a record ID, which is that's actually FileMaker's internally assigned record ID of 93. Um, if I want to get that specific record back, I can make a call to that endpoint. It's the same endpoint as before, but at the end of it, the end of the URL, I'm just going to put 93. And now I'm just getting back that one specific record. So, and you can see it's also bringing me back a, a lot more data than it did in the list view. And the reason for that is, if I jump back over to Zojo, um, I look at the method. Um, you might need to know a little bit of to understand what it's doing, but basically what I'm doing is looking at the URL um, of the request. And if the URL included a second parameter, then I know that the person is actually saying, hey, I want a specific record, and so I just sort of change the way that I send the request over the FileMaker server. Uh, in this specific example, I'm actually saying, give me a record with this specific ID. So that's uh, one way to do it. Now you could also set up your API so that it uses either FileMaker's internally assigned IDs, or if you have your own um, you know, sort of self-assigned contact IDs, whether they're you know, a serial number or a UUID, you can certainly wire up your API to do that as well. And there's an example in the code here that shows how that would work. So you don't have to use FileMaker's ID, but it's uh, certainly much easier. So there's an example of getting back a single record. And of course, you can combine this approach of getting a single record with some of the techniques or some of the features I showed you earlier. So for example, if I want to get a specific record back, um, Again, I'll get record 93 back and I want just certain fields, I can do that. So I guess what I'm uh, trying to say is that those, uh, the field filtering and aliasing, that works both for list views and for getting a single uh, form view, single record back. So before I continue, what if I had put in a, uh, an invalid contact number? What if I put something in where you know, it's a record that doesn't exist? Well, FM Luna's error handling uh, really tries to help you out here. If I send this request, you can see it actually comes back. It gives me um, the exact FileMaker error code that FileMaker 
search was in this case 101 it's basically telling me that the record that i'm asking for isn't there you know it's just not a valid uh, internal record id so and you'll see that really um, whether you're making uh, a request for data whether you're trying to put data into a table that maybe you're referencing an invalid uh, uh, column name or field name or maybe the value that you have in there isn't valid it'll actually send back to you the exact error code the file maker reported so if you're the API consumer and you do know a little bit about FileMaker, it should be easy to debug your API call, or at least a little bit easier to debug your API call. All right, let's see if we've got some questions. Okay, don't, okay. So, so far we've gotten back just standard data, you know, um, a lot of text values uh, and so on. Uh, but there was a question earlier about containers and whether FM Luna supported those. And yes, uh, again, FileMaker or FM Luna does support FileMaker's container fields. Let me show you how that works. So before I uh, make a request for one, let me actually go to a record. Give it in the form view. <coughs> I'm gonna add a photo here. I've got just a bunch of little sample images here. So I've got a PNG file in the container field. And let me look real quick. This is FileMaker's internal record ID is number two on this record. So I'm going to make an API call real quick to get record two. So let me do it on this one. And notice now that I have a, um, a value in the container, I'm now getting not only all those other field values, but I'm now getting a value for the photo as well. And this is actually a URL that FileMaker server supports. So um, if I take that and now make a uh, API call, and I'm just gonna clear part of the URL out to sort of tack that on to the end here and make this API call there's the uh, value coming back, the actual uh, file coming back out of that container. So again, what I did was I first uh, looked up the record itself. I think I did. Um, I got the, the URL, the value of the, the container field itself that came back from that first call. And then I just made a second call to FM Luna and I passed it that URL. And basically what FM Luna is doing is acting as a gateway between the client and FM server in this case, it's just taking that URL, it's asking FileMaker server if it actually has a value uh, for that particular record, um, that particular container field, and if so, it grabs it, um, pulls it into FM Luna, and then transfers it back down to the client. The cool thing about that is that um, it doesn't really matter whether the, uh, what the contents of the container are, it could be a PNG, it could be a JPEG, a PDF, Excel file, you name it, it'll, um, it'll return it. It'll also send back the right MIME type so that the client knows what to do with the file coming back. Um, and it also doesn't matter whether you're using internal or external storage, uh, you know, if whatever you throw in that container, it will return. So I think that's another really cool feature of FM Luna, the fact that you can get not only sort of standard data back, but any binary data that's in containers. Um, I've even included other FileMaker files in containers and sort of pulled those through as well. So <laughs> you can do some wild stuff with that. I think another question came in. Does the FileMaker database have to be hosted? Could you just access a local FileMaker file? It does have to be hosted. And the reason is that um, FM Luna is using custom web publishing and. Uh, unfortunately, the only way that's available is through FileMaker server. I think it goes back to nine, maybe the first uh, version of FileMaker server that supported XML. I could be wrong about that, but you can go way back, <laughs> and uh, FM Luna uh, should be able to work with it. You might make, have to make some minor changes to some of the older versions of FileMaker server, but um, for the most part, it should just work. Do I need a special calc field for the photo URL? Um, no, you don't. Actually, the cool thing about the uh, 
that container that I just showed you is that that's all that there is to it in the database. Um, move this off to the side. You know, I don't have any special calculation that I had to add to the FileMaker side. There's nothing special happening on the Luna side. As soon as the um, a file ends up in that container field and you happen to reference a record that has one, again, that value gets returned to you from the API call. Let me try to move some of these windows out of the way. Again, here it is right here. That happens automatically. FileMaker server sends that back. So that's really all you need to do to then make that next call back and say, okay, great, give me what you've got in that container and then it sends it back to you. So let's see, I think there was one other. Uh, can you upload containers? You could. Uh, FileMaker, or FM Luna rather, does not support um, uploading to containers uh, right out of the box. You could certainly add that yourself. Um, and I've got a bunch of different approaches that you, know, you could use to do that. Uh, but yeah, if that's something that you're interested in and you want to reach out to me um, you know, after the webinar, if you're curious as to how you might do that, let me know. But yeah, you, you could certainly push data up and into container fields as well. Just would take a little bit of extra work. Um, I've also got some um, APIs that are running right now where you can upload through the API. And instead of putting it into a container field in FileMaker, you could actually save it off to Amazon S3 and then make a note of where it is in your Amazon S3 buckets. The nice thing about that is you end up with your binary data you know, stored somewhere in the cloud. It's being served up very quickly, um, and you're not bloating your FileMaker database with all that unnecessary you know, images and whatever else you've got in those container fields. So that makes backing up your database easier. It makes performance of the data a little snappier. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to handle binary data, but if you are currently uh, storing data in containers, Again, right out of the box, FM Luna can serve those up. So that was containers. And then I showed you earlier this uh, example of where I happen to make a reference to the API and FileMaker server has a problem with it. Again, it'll come back and give you the nice FileMaker uh, you know, error code and description of the error. So that might not help the person that's making the API call because they might not understand what those FileMaker errors are. But when they talk to you and they say, hey, I'm getting this error back, it's certainly going to make your life a little bit easier to look up that FileMaker error code and say, okay, I think I know what's going on here. Uh, so hopefully that'll help. It's going to take a drink here before I totally lose my voice. Okay, so I've shown you how you can get data through the API, both um, sort of standard data as well as binary data from containers. Let me show you a couple of uh, other API calls for uh, working with data that's already, or adding data, changing data, and deleting data through the API. So this first API call is very similar, looks very similar as far as the URL goes to that first one that I made where I got a list of records back. It looks very similar. Big difference is I'm changing the HTTP method from get to post. And so in this case, I'm actually telling the API I want to add a record to the context table. And here's the record that I want to add. And you can see it's just a, a JSON uh, formatted, or encoded rather, um, list of name value pairs, where I've got the field name and then the value that I want to uh, store in the, those particular fields. Um, Paul makes this really nice. If I switch from text to JSON, you can see it kind of breaks it up and makes it even easier to see what I'm sending. But if I send this API call, or request rather, you can see that um, FM Luna actually returned back to me a record. What it did was it created the record in FileMaker and then it returned it right back to me. Uh, it came back with a 201 created um, status code. And if I jump over into FileMaker, you can see that sure enough, I now have 101 records. Let me go to that very last one. And there's the one that I just created through the API. So uh, the nice thing about that is that it not only creates the record and then returns it, but when it returns it to you, it actually tells you the internally um, assigned FileMaker record ID. So I can now use that to make another type of call. 
So to update that record, I'm going to use, again, a very similar um, uh, looking URL to what we saw before. In this case, I'm telling it I want to put a record into the context table, or rather, I want to update a record in the context table. Change the record ID to 146. And the other big difference this time is I'm going to, instead of making a get or a post request, I'm actually going to change the method to patch. So I'm telling uh, FM Luna that we're updating a record in the context table where the um, ID is 146. I'm going to change the, uh, the street address from was 101 Red Valley Drive to I'll make it something else. It's Sunrise Valley Drive behind it. Maybe I'll change my name and make that request. And this time again, it comes back this time with a 200 OK uh, response telling me that, you know, great, I've saved your changes. And by the way, here's your record. Um, and you can see that the record that it returned reflects the updates that I made to it. If I jump back in the FileMaker now, you can see that the address, sure enough, has changed, and so has my name. So the update worked perfectly. So that's a patch request, and that's how you would update uh, an existing record through the API. And of course, the last thing I might want to do is actually get rid of that record that I created. So this time, I'm going to make uh, a delete request. That's going to be the method. And the URL looks very similar to the patch. I'm going to tell it I want to delete a record in the context table. And FileMaker's uh, internally assigned record ID is 146. If I send that request, this time I get a 204 no content uh, response. And that's just the um, FM Luna's way of telling you I was able to delete the record, but this time I don't really have anything to show you because I just deleted what you told me to delete. So I don't, <laughs> I can't send it back to you. So it was full. If I jump over to FileMaker, you see that I'm back to having just 100 records, and that one that I had created and updated is now gone. So very, very simple, um, you know, RESTful type uh, API for things like creating, updating, deleting records. It doesn't get much easier than that. So let me look at my notes here, see what else we were going to talk about. I think that's it as far as the API scale. Let me see if there's any questions. Nothing yet. Okay, so I'm going to jump back over to get this out of the way. There we go. So that was the demo. So there's some things that I did not cover because I don't want to talk for an hour. <laughs> but uh, some features of, of FM Luna that I didn't cover in the demo I include, again, the ability to get related records. Uh, I, the example I used was if the contacts table had a relationship to something like companies or clients or something like that, you could certainly create a relationship between those tables and then pull related data over. It would be returned through the API. As far as portals go, my recommendation is to keep it simple and just make a second API call for the child records or the related records. It gets much easier to work with, not only from the standpoint of the person developing the API, but then also from the uh, developer that's consuming that API. Uh, but if you do want to get uh, complicated with your endpoints, you can certainly return a parent record, and then multiple sets of related child records if you want to. It just depends on uh, how complicated you want to make it. So the other uh, thing I didn't show was some API calls to get uh, sort of metadata from FileMaker. If you wanted to do that, you could get a list of script names back, layout names, uh, fields that are on the layout. If you want to do that, you could certainly um, uh, set up uh, endpoints in your FM Luna API to return that type of data. can also create uh, endpoints to do weird things. <laughs> For example, if you want to um, just have an endpoint that um, maybe runs a script on FileMaker server, maybe it's going to log something or something like that. Or one of the questions that came up earlier is, can you um, you know, make SQL-like uh, requests through FM Luna. Uh, you could certainly do that using some of those, uh, using uh, the ability to run a script. You could have it, um, you know, run a script, take the data, throw it into a container field, and then return that through FM Luna. So you could have it, you know, be a delimited uh, uh, 
data set, if you will, of a SQL select result. Uh, FMLUNA also supports what I've been calling uh, concurrency issue prevention. So if you've ever developed a web app where um, you have a user who's maybe looking at a record through a web application or even a mobile application today, and they're looking at a, a version of it, maybe they, they just pulled it up, they're looking at it in list view, or detail view rather, and then someone else, another user, updates a record somewhere. Maybe they're working directly on the database, they found like a pro or go or what have you, but that's not, change isn't gonna be reflected immediately over in the other client who's maybe gone through the API. So if that other client then goes to make a change as well, they might stomp on the changes that the other user made. And so you can actually um, design your endpoints to take that into account. So that if the first user tries to update something and the record has changed on them between the time that they looked at it and the time they submitted the updates, you can have uh, FM Luna sort of come back and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's a new version of the record on the server, here's what it looks like, or you can handle it however you want. You can let the user stomp on the changes or maybe resolve the conflicts, but FM Luna can certainly handle that and uh, does it pretty well. The other thing I didn't talk too much about is versioning the API. So it's always great when you've got a fresh API that you've released, but these things are kind of living and breathing <laughs> entities, if you will. You know there's going to be changes to them later on. Some of those changes might be significant. And so, you know, as the, if the developer of the API, you have to support not only the original version of the API, but then, you know, new versions as well. So the way that the uh, FM Luna handles versioning is pretty uh, pretty simple. You know, you just kind of change the URLs that the user wants to uh, or is going to use to make the API calls, and then you set up some new endpoints in FM Luna that reflect, say, the version two, version three versions of the uh, endpoint, and uh, and that's how it works. So it's pretty simple. So those are the features that I did not cover. And let me see if there's any other questions. I can get up to the Q&A window. As a file maker developer, how hard is it to learn what I need to do in the Zojo app? Um, I, you know, it's going to depend on the kind of API that you're setting up and the, end, the nature of the endpoints, um, you know, how complicated they are. But I think that the, uh, if you look at the sample uh, FM Luna instance that, that I've provided, it's commented and it's basic enough that you can set up, very easily set up support for uh, providing lists of records, single records. Good, it's got good examples and good comments in there for you to sort of take what's there, even if you don't know Zojo very well, and kind of tweak what's there to meet your specific needs. So I don't think you need to know a lot as far as the Zojo language goes. Obviously, the more you know, the better. Uh, but it also, you know, I say that, and I think it's also a really great way to learn about Zojo, um, to learn the language, you know, because you can go in there, you can look at the examples, you can tweak them, you can do the whole, well, what if I do this, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe it breaks, maybe it does something different. Uh, but I think it's a great way to learn Zojo and sort of get your foot in the door as far as, uh, get your feet wet, rather, as far as um, Zojo goes. You know, it might be, uh, your sort of gateway into the Zojo world. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I don't, again, I don't think you need to know a lot, but I think it's a great way to learn a lot. So, so a question from Jason, he asks, does FM Luna Zojo app have to live on the same server that Pomaker server is running on? Um, again, no, it does not. Um, it certainly could. Uh, you can specify what uh, port the uh, FM Luna web application is running on so that there's no conflicts with FileMaker server or whatever else you've got running on that server. The benefit of having FM Luna running on that server obviously would be decreased latency between FM Luna and the database. Um, but again, it, it does not have to run on that. So one of the things, I've actually got a client who has multiple FileMaker servers hosted internally and um, you know, they're very particular about what they'll let come through their firewall. So what we did was we set up FM Luna on an EC2 server and um, just sort of punched a hole through their firewall just for that EC2 instance. 
So um, external clients make their API calls to FM Loon or running on the EC2 server. EC2 server sends a request through the firewall to hit the uh, protected Pomaker server uh, instances. And, um, you know, there's no exposure then, no direct exposure to the outside world uh, as far as the servers go. So I think the ability to run FM Luna on other servers really is potentially a huge benefit. So Gaston asked, um, FM Luna is open source. Can you explain what would be the ideal path for developers who want to be, want to share added improved features? Um, good question. Uh, FM Luna, I have not put that version of it um, up on Git or anything like that. Uh, it's something I certainly could do, but yeah, it's open source. So if you want to make additions to it or you want to share examples of it, uh, I'd be happy to put it up on GitHub and uh, just like we did with the standard version of Luna. And it would be great to see what people are doing with it, kind of additions they're making. Uh, you know, it'd be really kind of neat to see what people come up with. So. A good question. All right, do we have any other questions? We answered that one. All right, so I guess we'll wrap up. Continue back to my slides here. Um, if you've got other uh, questions or want to learn more about FM Luna, you just go to my website. It's tindietrick.me slash FM Luna. And uh, I think Paul will include that in the webinar notes. Um, along with any other links that we've got. Um, and if you've got any questions or anything, let me know. Could happen here. Okay, there we go. Uh, I wanted to talk just real quick about some other projects I'm working on. Um, when I released FM Luna, I think on the same day, I also released uh, something called FM Containers. Uh, FM Containers, you can think of it as just the, almost like just the container feature of uh, FM Luna. Where, uh, meaning that it, it's something that serves up the contents of containers in a FileMaker database. But what makes FM Containers different from FM Luna is that it supports really nice uh, sort of SEO-friendly URLs. So if you're serving up images, for example, or any kind of files that are stored in a FileMaker, uh, in a FileMaker database in the containers, and you're worried about the SEO for those things, um, FM can continue for you to look at. Uh, the URLs are much cleaner uh, than what you saw me uh, using as far as making the same kind of calls through FM Luna. You know, they're real, they kind of look almost like something you see from WordPress, um, you know, where you have sort of a permalink type thing. So they're not absolutely beautiful URLs, but they're not crazy like the standard URLs that FM server typically kicks out. So um, you can find out more about that on my website as well. It's timdietrich.me slash fmcontainers. Um, another project I'm working on, and I'm actually going to be releasing this, I think, uh, in a week or two. I'm calling it FM API Assistant. And think of it as the flip side of FM Luna, uh, where FM Luna sort of lets you build an API for a FileMaker database. This API Assistant will let you, or make it easier for you, rather, to consume um, APIs from within FileMaker. Um, and so if, for those of you who are familiar with um, insert from URL, the script step in FileMaker, you know that it's limited as to what it can do. You can only do get and post requests from it. You can't do put, patch, delete. Um, you can't adjust the headers. And there's also no support, native support, for uh, parsing JSON. Uh, you can do that with plugins, obviously, in Go, or rather with uh, Pro. Um, but it's kind of challenging if you're, if you've got Go clients, uh, WebDirect, and so on, um, where, you know, plugins are a potential issue. What this thing does is it lets you just make an insert from URL, just a post request uh, to this FM API Assistant application. And the FM API assistant will then make the API call for you. So you can actually tell it, I need to do a patch request. Here's the URL. Here's the body of the message I want to send. I've got some custom headers thrown in. And the FM, FM API will handle all that for you. I've got that coming probably the next week or two. So if you follow me on either on Twitter or on my blog, I'll be talking more about that soon. I'm also working on a Zergio book. Um, it's a step-by-step -step course for developing Zojo iOS apps. I'm hoping to have that out sometime in the fall. 
And uh, we, Paul and I talked before the show a little about XDC, which is the Zojo Developer Conference. It's in October in Houston. And uh, as Paul said, you can sign up really right up to the last minute. Uh, but if you want to learn more, just go to zojo.com slash XDC. This is actually going to be my first XDC, and I'm uh, presenting two sessions, one on, uh, on APIs and a second one on developing apps for the Apple TV and the role that Zojo can play in both of those areas. So kind of excited about not only being at my first XDC, but presenting as well. So some excitement and some nervousness there at the same time. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. Nope. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, Paul, is there anything else that we need to do to wrap things up? Well, certainly I need to thank you, Tim, for taking the time to show off these uh, cool little techniques. I always like to see ways that Zojo can be used to complement and even kind of supercharge FileMaker to allow it to do stuff that it might otherwise not be able to do or maybe be a little tricky to do. So it's always good seeing these efforts. So thank you again, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And I want to thank everyone for attending. This is the end of the webinar. Have a great day.